All right, welcome uh, to this afternoon's seminar for science writers here at the 224th AAS meeting in Boston, Massachusetts. I'm Rick Feinberg, AAS press officer, and I'm glad to see you here. I know we have uh, at least one person, I'm pretty sure, watching our webcast, probably a few more. Can you turn that sound down in the back, please? Thank you. All right. So this is not going to be as formal as a press conference, though I will introduce it as if it were one. Uh, this is a seminar for science writers. It's a background, or it's an opportunity to learn something about a new emerging field within astronomy that will presumably have uh, increasing impact over time. You're all familiar with big science. We've had some uh, interesting results presented at this conference from big science, like the Hubble Space Telescope and the Chandra X-ray Observatory, and of course the giant uh, telescopes on high mountains around the world. Uh, well, you know that there are, those are like flagship missions. There are also explorer satellites and there are small explorer satellites. And we're going to be talking about really tiny, teeny, weeny, nano, pico satellites today. And we have, uh, we originally had three, but now we've, we've managed to accrete a fourth distinguished speaker. Uh, I will tell you who, well, you can see who the three are. The three that we originally planned are Sandy Antunis, did I get that right? All right, from Capital College in Maryland, and uh, Garrett Jernigan from the Little H Bar Ranch, one of the hottest places to do astronomy in all of the world, and Lynn Kaminsky from Sonoma State University. Many of you will recognize Lynn because she served for many years as deputy press officer to Steve Marin here at the AAS. And Lynn is also the public information officer for a number of high energy missions, including Fermi and Swift. And so uh, the three of them were involved in a, um, in a session earlier this week about small satellites and their growing impact in astronomy. And uh, we've managed to, um, to corral a fourth speaker for today as well, uh, someone who many of you know by name, if not by sight, Jonathan McDowell from the Harvard Smithsonian Center for Astrophysics. Jonathan is a, uh, a keen watcher of all things space, uh, puts out a, an online newsletter, uh, and used to have a column. You don't still, right, in Sky and Tell? No, uh, that's right, you gave it up. Yeah. It well, you know, <laughs> if you hadn't laid it down by now, they'd have probably sacked you anyway. So, um, so, so we're gonna uh, we're gonna have a seminar for science writers, which means you know it's gonna be a little more interactive than a than a formal press conference. Um, if you have questions, uh, please raise your hand. Uh, the speakers have told me it's fine if, if you interrupt. But because we're on doing a webcast, we still need you to wait for a microphone. Otherwise, the question that you interrupt us for uh, won't be heard by the people online. Similarly, if you're <coughs> online and you have a question, please indicate so on the uh, webcast chat. And my deputy, Larry Marshall, will uh, attempt to get our attention and relay your question up to the panelists. So with that, I'm going to turn it over to the first speaker, Sandy, who uh, organized the session earlier this week. And uh, we'll see what we have to learn about small satellites. Thank you, Rick. Ta-da. OK. So we are talking about Pico satellites, which are literally this size. This is a 3D printed model of it. Um, it's a small package kind of like stealing from Apple, uh, it's time to think different with what we can do with it. A lot of the value of this is the do-it-yourself movement and the maker movement. DIY space is a thing. Uh, there are books in it that are sort of uh, stealth um, astronomy, remote sensing, orbital mechanics guides that are out for it. And specifically for science use, that's the new area. There's over 100 PICO satellites either launched or mostly being planned and being built. A lot are tech demos or engineering projects. The reason for the special session is to get the idea out about some of the genuine science that can be done with PICO satellites and specifically best done with PICO satellites. The, the pros is that they are very inexpensive to build and launch, um, often 100,000 or less for a student team to build and launch, and the bulk of that is the launch costs. And that means that they're very low risk. Um, so we can accept a high failure rate, and we'll have some stats on just what uh, the numbers are for a high failure rate. Allows rapid development of ideas, 
but most importantly for science, you can cheaply deploy many. You know, the downsides are they are small. They're, you're not going to be able to fit a Hubble class telescope in this. Um, you're not going to be able to put in giant metal plates for doing hard x-ray. But there are areas that they work really well in. If you can handle the small size, the low weight, the fact that currently we have low data rates, although everyone's trying to solve that, and again, the high failure rate. So among the, the uses for it, obviously, are teaching. Teaching engineering, uh, teaching the entire integration process, teaching builds, teaching what satellites can do, uh, prototyping detector technology. But where they excel is in in situ measurements. Instead of setting up an imaging detector, something that's measuring the space environment where the satellite itself is. Uh, the best analogy I can give you is putting temperature buoys across the ocean. You get a thermal map of the entire ocean. Well, you can put magnetic field sensors in PICO satellites and distribute them and get a magnetic field map of the ionosphere changing in time. And suddenly, these little boxes, I love the term shoebox satellite. I don't know if you or uh, Lynn coined that term. But these little shoebox satellites are suddenly doing science that can't be done in another way. And so that leads to constellations and swarms of them. Um, my own stake in the game at Capitol College is that we are putting slabs of aerogel in to capture little bits of orbital debris and profile space junk and orbital debris, but that also means that we can profile uh, translunar or interplanetary dust if we can put them on with other missions. So that's one you know, sort of thing, different direction we can go. In the seminar, we also had Dayton Jones talking about some of the Jet Propulsion Laboratory missions with uh, radio and the idea of putting up a radio antenna, just a single radio antenna floating around, and then what happens if you put an aggregate of them? And he went through the science drivers for that uh, and the science types of goals, and particularly useful for this group, and these slides are available from the press office if you want them, is not only the history that this builds on, but that for cosmology, extragalactic work, and galactic work, transient sources, UAG particles, the solar system, heliophysics, and Earth, radio antennas floating in a PICO satellite alone can do bona fide science that's currently not being done. And he broke it out by how many PICO satellites would you need to achieve fundamental science goals. Um, so if you're looking for dark age uh, spectral signatures, one PICO satellite could start to give you measurements for that. Some of these things are a little out of range. You'd need 10,000 PICO satellites to do extrasolar uh, work in radio with it. but. Some of them are feasible, and these kind of feasibility studies are showing that, you know, we're going beyond the, uh, this is just an engineering build and saying these are useful for genuine science. And so he has a, a good summary of how far you can get with a single CubeSat, a few CubeSats, 20, 100, and greater than 100 as a map of which science domain it is and which particular topics you can get. And it's important to realize that these are not being built yet. Um, there's a couple groups doing one or two, but this is where things are going. So a lot of what this workshop is is to say, sort of prime you all for things that are coming down the pikes, that when something comes down, you can evaluate, is this significant or is it, you know, something that's already been done? You can focus your attention properly. Um, one success story we had at the seminar, uh, Scott Palo talked about uh, the instrument is called Reptile, and the mission is the Colorado Student Space Weather Experiment, with a very awkward acronym. And this is notable, and we'll have some stats soon, because this was a science PICO satellite. It's a three-unit one, so it's three of these cubes together to make it a little bit bigger. And it actually returned bona fide science data. Um, it uh, was designed to operate for four months. It's returned 20-plus uh, months, and it's still up there. Um, that map there is a map of the data that it was taking in terms of electron distribution. So you see the uh, South Atlantic anomaly in yellow there, the dip of the magnetic field line showing an en enhanced particle count. And this satellite is uh, doing bona fide science work. So it's student created, um, small, inexpensive, doing real science. So if you want better, faster, cheaper, this certainly you know, fits in, even though I know that's like a no longer in vogue these days. So those are the directions that we went with the seminar and some of the possibilities. And next up is Jonathan, who's going to tell you a little bit about the uh, history and some of the rates that things went. And always feel free to interrupt with questions at any point. But we, we're going to go through the briefing quickly, and then we'll do a lot of questions and answers for the second half as well. So um, the era of the small satellite has arrived. If you look on the left, 
Uh, you can see a histogram of satellite masses from most of the space age, 1960 to 2009. It's a log axis from a tenth of a kilogram all the way up to 100 ton space shuttles. Uh, and from most of the space era, uh, the masses were between, uh, were, were biased to the one to 10 ton kind of range. Uh, but if you look at the lower left plot, that's the, since 2010, wow, look at that. The, uh, the low end of that histogram has barreled up. Uh, there the are now many satellites in the nano satellite class of 10 kilograms or less. And to look at that in more detail, the central histogram here shows the launch rate between the first CubeSat in 2003 uh, and the current year. And what you see is that there was a pretty uh, slowly increasing rate until a couple years ago when we got past the student experiment, let's take a webcam of Earth, and got into the era of let's do real things with these CubeSats. The data rates have gone up. The uh, power has gone up. We can actually uh, make use of these CubeSats. And so wham, in the, in the year of February 2013 to February 2014, there were as many CubeSats launched in that year as in the whole previous 10 years of the CubeSat era. Uh, and uh, I divided them up. These are all CubeSats, by the way. I, I, uh, actually, there's three missing. I couldn't find them, but yeah. Um, the, uh, uh, I divided them into uh, uh, academic, uh, uh, university, student-built satellites, 108. Uh, uh, commercial entities, 40, civil space agencies, 17, defense-related, 41. So you see many of them are, are, are sort of these student-built university projects. Uh, space science or space experiments are now finally within a university budget. Uh, and, uh, but the problem is that when you use them as uh, training for undergraduate engineers, um, over, over the right column I have the total failure rate, by which I mean uh, you didn't even get a peep out of your satellite. You couldn't make uh, communications with your, between your ground station and your satellite. And for the student-built ones, it's running at about a 20% uh, failure rate. Um, and, uh, of course, there are many others which, although they could communicate, they may not have fully achieved their missions. That's hard to kind of do a metric on because some, many of these satellites are not very ambitious, whereas others are extremely ambitious, and so it's not fair to compare them. Uh, but what is the, the good news is that the ones that were built more professionally do have a much lower failure rate, maybe a few percent. Um, there are many satellites, even the student-built ones, that have operated more than two years. There are 38 satellites that have lasted more than two years. Uh, uh, and currently, of the 206 CubeSats orbited, uh, 117 are still working. Uh, not all science sets. Not all science sets. sets. That's absolutely right. There are only a dozen are science sets. And, uh, and that's a graph I forgot to, to do, the, the, the breakdown for mission. Uh, and 29 different countries have been involved uh, in this. So it's very widespread. But Mostly U.S., 130. Japan, very popular in the Japanese universities. And Germany, very active too. So, so that's sort of overview of how, how big a deal this changes. It's not just a few labs putting together these small satellites. It's now becoming a significant fraction of the number of satellites launched. Uh, and, the, and the reason it's going up is because they now have the capability uh, to do useful things, including science. Okay, I'm Garrett Jernigan. I want to talk about a, a, a satellite um, that's in a class called Pocket Cube. And uh, you heard about CubeSats. That's a 1U CubeSat. A Pocket Cube, this is a life size model. There are paper models up here for everyone if you want to take one home and make it or give it to your kids. It's a, it's a one to one scale model. This is the actual, actual size of it. Um, so it's smaller than a CubeSat. This particular one is 5 by 5 by 15 centimeters. And we're going to start building new ones that are 5 by 5 by 10. They're a little bit smaller. And the point of these mainly is to teach students how they build their own satellites and to get the launch cost done by making them smaller so you can launch more of them. Um, now, I started this because I have two goals. Um, 
build little satellites this that are built by students. And this did work on orbit for two months. It was a, a, a complete, complete success from my point of view. All the goals that we had for uh, the important goals were all met probably within the first month. Um, but I consider this a step towards astronomy with CubeSats, which are, I think of mostly as being 3U, three times the size, the size of the one that you just heard about. So there's two paths, one for students and education and another path to do real astronomy. And of course, un undergrads built this one. Maybe grad students can build the bigger ones. So um, this is the T Lego Two team. I want to point out, um, you can reach a lot of students here. You can see there were, there were students from Sonoma State University and also from Moorhead State University. And then I got a lot of help from professional mentors who graciously donated all their time free of charge. So th there weren't really any labor cost. Um, I want to point out two people. Professor Twiggs is the co-inventor of the CubeSat. So if you want to learn about CubeSats, you probably should read about Bob Twiggs. Um, he's the inventor of the pocket cube. We were sitting at the conference two years ago. Everybody was talking about 6U, 12U, megabytes, gigabytes of data. And Bob and I looked at each other and he said, let's go small. And so Bob invented the pocket cube about that time. And so I thought it was a great opportunity to build something cheaper and smaller that students could build. Um, now, when we first got up, um, this is called a waterfall plot. I won't try to explain it in detail, but basically it's an image of what your, what your antenna sees. And we went up with 28 other satellites on the same rocket out of Russia. Out of a Dnieper rocket, we were inside of an Italian satellite. So the Italian satellite jumped out of the, the Russian rocket, and an hour later we jumped out of the Italian satellite. And Bob Twiggs had arranged basically a free ride for us. So we didn't have to pay for that. So we had no launch cost. Um, I was trying to find our satellite the first day. And so we took our antennas that we built in my backyard, the students built with me. And we were wagging the antenna back and forth, back and forth, because the Air Force tracks the satellites. But it takes them one to two weeks before they can tell you where your satellite is. So I worked out that if we just wagged the antenna back and forth, we would find the satellites. Sure enough, that's what I saw. Pins of satellites all in the same plot. This is like 20 seconds. This is like uh, 20 seconds of data. This is the whole, basically a full megahertz piece of the 70 centimeter handband. So of course I was very excited until I realized that our satellite was not in the picture. So I was, I was quite upset about that. But anyway, I, I don't think, I've never seen a plot quite like this that showed so many at once. That was kind of a fun thing. Now, this is where we're headed. Down below is the actual flight board of the satellite. Maybe you could hold that up. Maybe we could pass it around if people want to look at it. That's an actual copy of the flight board. That's the thing that flew. And that's down below. And so you see the radio on the left and the uh, magnetometer on the right. The processor is actually on the back. And um, the point about this is the students were able to do everything themselves. They even made their own PC boards, did all the soldering. Everything was done right at Sonoma State. And uh, the key to this was we had to build it nine months, so we had four-hour turnaround from a change to having a new flight board. And we went through, I think, you know, I think at least 10 res before we got it right. Um, this is um, on orbit. Um, this is another one of those plots where frequencies left to right. Time is going up and down. So the time is traveling up on the screen. This is a snapshot. You can see that we sent a ground command. That's that thing at the top. And then immediately we started getting the data. That was within like two, uh, a day and a half of launching. And immediately, the, that was the exciting point. We sent the command. That's the thing down below with the radio right over there. You hold up the ground radio. That's the ground radio. It's two $11 radios. There's one in there. There's one on the satellite. Um, and they talk to each other uh, at a range of 2,700 kilometers which is way beyond what I hoped for. I, hope, I thought we, people told me we'd only see it straight overhead. We saw it 15 degrees above the horizon. And so this was the exciting point we saw that data. Um, the other thing I want to mention is th what's really important about this satellite is that it uses a new kind of language that's never been used in space. Never, it's been, the language is not new, but it's never been used for a spacecraft. I think it's a great language for students because it's so simple to read. So you can see like one of the lines there, F print read solar three average. Well, that just reads the voltage coming out of the third solar panel. So the language almost reads like what you're doing. Because one of the big problems with working with undergraduates is, well, I don't know how to program computers. And so we're, we're trying to develop a methodology where 
they, they don't have to learn C code and all those things that are really hard to learn and to try to make it really simple. This, that's probably the key point of this satellite. And I actually will say this, no one will believe me, but I think this satellite has the most sophisticated software of any satellite that I've ever worked on. And I, the last satellite I worked on cost $40 million. And I've worked on billion dollar satellites. This satellite was $1,000 of parts. There's my antenna in the backyard that was also built by the students, the grind radio, and there's a commercial radio. And um, I won't go through this long list of achievements, except to say, you know, we did a lot of stuff on the flight, the ground. The main point I want to make here is everything we did is free to everybody. It's open hardware and open software, which basically means there are no licensing fees. There are not even licenses for free. There are no licenses. You just get it. You can use it. You can copy the hardware and use it to make your own satellite. And you can also copy the grind system, and we have all the software will be in public domain. It may take a, another six months before we can get it all documented well enough to release it, but we will re release all of it um, very quickly. It, it, how much time do I have left? Just keep going. Okay. Um, in the next version of the satellite, we're going to fly th this thing called a CZT array, and we're going to do gamma ray astronomy for the first time on a, on a small satellite like this. So we're going to be able to detect gamma rays, like you hear the talks from, from the gamma ray, big gamma ray satellites. The first satellite's just going to have two square centimeter detector. Uh, which doesn't do too well for the astronomy part, but it can easily see, for example, a flare from the sun, a hard flare from the sun. They happen every day. We'll probably see some of those. So it's a little bit more of a demonstration to be able to do science. And then where we're headed next is to build a 3U uh, CubeSat that will have 64 square centimeters of these arrays in a 3U box, and it will actually uh, really do gamma ray astronomy for uh, this new and the new thing this will do is it'll also measure for the first time polarization of gamma ray bursts. Yes. A quick question, Garrett. Sure. Uh, the uh, uh, looking at that uh, circuit board just now. Yes. Um, by the way, this is Larry Marshall, one of the deputy press officers for the people on the web. Um, the um, uh, the it actually looks like you could have made the circuit board much smaller than you did. Is there a reason for that? Did this, you need to keep the yeah, processor this, away from the magnetometer or something like that? No, the reason was we, were, we want to plug that in the middle, but we didn't have time to debug it and test it. See, it has room in a socket for the gamma ray detector. You see the picture? Yeah. There's a socket on the board. We, we were really close, and the thing that I learned about making CubeSats with students is the key to making it work on orbit is to test and test. So we tested this thing for almost two months, 24-7. And if I had tried to put that in and debug it, we wouldn't have tested but for a few weeks. And that is the guaranteed way to fail. So much to my demand, I wasn't happy about it, but I said, look, guys, if we put it in, we're going to fail. And part of what I'm trying to teach students is not just to learn from the process, but the goal is to succeed. I, I'm not the kind of person that believes that um, you may fail for lots of reasons, okay, but you don't want to say the words, we learned a lot, it's okay. Because as a scientist, I don't think it's okay to fail. So one of the things I'm trying to teach the students is not just to do it, but actually do it with the full intent to be successful. So that's the answer to that question. Now, th this thing would have 32 times the aperture of what, what you just saw. And this has a coded aperture up here. And the new thing, it has these beryllium ears here. The thing spins around, and those beryllium ears would allow us to measure the polarization of a gamma ray burst, which is probing the jets that come out of the formation of a black hole. You make these jets, some theorists, a minority, believe that they're highly polarized. Other theorists would say they're not polarized at all. And so that's what I'm going to try to do as my first main gamma ray astronomy thing. I have one more to show real quick. This is a 3U satellite that I call Dan John. This was a proposal. Um, both of these pro proposals, these are proposals. They haven't happened yet. Um, they were proposed like three or four years ago, and they basically lost because the reviewers said students cannot build satellites that work. That was the primary reason they lost. Um, I got basically really, lo we got really low scores in every category, nowhere close to being funded. Um, the only thing I was praised for is I had Bob Twiggs on my team. I got a, I got a gold star for having Bob Twiggs as my partner, but otherwise. So now we've launched this, it's worked, and the next time we turn in a proposal at the end of the summer, they're not going to be able to say that we can't build a satellite. Um, this satellite is, is designed to take images of the moon and measure the albedo of the Earth. 
which determines the solar input the, to the Earth, the primary parameter of climate change. How much sunlight is reaching the, is reaching the Earth? And this little satellite, I won't go into details, but it's big, it's, it's big enough to do that. These are, uh, you know, four little telescopes that are just a few centimeters in size. And I'll stop there. Can I add a little thing on to there? Go ahead. Um, with his talk of uh, small telescopes, every astronomer has a favorite target. You know, you write six papers on algal, you're the algal person and this and that. Wouldn't it be nice to have a small aperture photometer or an X-ray <laughs> telescope looking at algal 24-7, 365 days? I mean, we could have individual satellites devoted to an object at this price point. I, I want to mention the poster, too. The link in the chat. Okay, so I'm going to um, take a slightly different tack here. I'm going to talk about the use of satellites as part of an educational pipeline program that I've been doing at Sonoma State in, with my day job when I'm not running around doing press for black holes and things. So this is all about uh, the first project that we did. And, and this is a problem that I had noticed uh, a few years ago when I started writing proposals to try to get money to do these things. There is a broken pipeline in the STEM world having to do with rocketry and space launching. And of course, this is manifest by the fact that the generations of engineers that built all the big space programs are retiring, and there are very few engineers with any actual real space experience in the pipeline to replace them. And so, where are these people going to come from? Where are the students going to learn the investigation and experimentation and hardware skills that can turn these people into the Apollo engineers of the future. Well, there's a program that you may have heard of called TARC, Team America Rocketry Challenge, and it's tremendously successful. It's run by the National Association of Rocketry. And there are like 600 teams of middle and high school kids a year that participate in this, thousands of students. And they build model rockets, they go to 500 to 700 feet, they carry an egg, they try to land the egg safely. And the kids get all excited. And then what? Well, there's nowhere for them to go after that. There's a program in Michigan, Sheboygan Spaceport, Rockets for Schools, where maybe 60 of these teams in the area around Michigan get to build satellites that go up to 5,000 feet and can actually make some measurements. And then NASA used to have a program called NASA Student Launch Initiative, where they'd pick, say, the top 15 of these TARC teams and offer them the chance to build an experiment that could go in a high-powered rocket. Well, this year, even that program was not funded and did not happen because of all of the EPO cutbacks um, at NASA. So then after that, there's the University Student Launch Initiative, which did go on. So if you get all the way to college, you can go back to building rocket experiments. And maybe if you're a grad student, you can work on the sound, a sounding rocket with a very sophisticated experiment that's you know, part of your graduate student education. So I tried to solve this problem by actually getting some money from NASA three years ago now. We call it the S-4 program, Small Satellites for Secondary Students. And so we've been flying rockets and tethered balloons, and we've been designing uh, flight electronics and software for high school students and middle school students to build themselves that can then be launched on not model rockets, not the little things that you can buy in the hobby store, but high-powered rockets that are about six feet tall that are launched in conjunction with the amateur rocket clubs. And just like there's a whole network of amateur astronomy clubs around the country that do star parties and all sorts of wonderful outreach, there is a huge network worldwide of amateur rocket clubs that do high-powered rocketry. And the rockets can go from 5,000 to even 100,000 feet. So last summer, we trained a bunch of teachers how to build the payloads, and then we launched them at the Lucerne Dry Lake Bed in South uh, California. And this year, the teachers are building these payloads and launching them with their middle and high school students. Now, this is being done in association with my personal rocket club, AeroPAC, the Association of Experimental Rocketry of the Pacific, um, with help from people like Tony Alcacer and Ken Baiba. We also launched balloons down in Paso Robles with Steve Cleaver and the Endeavor Institute and a few of the other local rocket clubs. But the story goes back to Bob Twiggs again, because Bob Twiggs is the founder of the Arliss program. 
ARLA stands for a rocket launch for international student satellites. And he did this program in conjunction with our rocket club, Aeropac. Started over 10 years ago. University student teams come from all over the world to the Black Rock Playa, same place they have Burning Man, but a few weeks later. All the burning people are gone. They're just cleaning up the garbage. We're out there shooting off rockets with payloads. And the really sad thing about this is that almost all the student teams are coming from other countries. They're not coming from the U.S. There may be two United States teams. There's one from Hawaii. Sometimes there's one from um, another from Cal Poly. But almost all the teams are graduate students coming from Japan, from Korea, from other countries to launch really exciting payloads that have been developed by these students. Well, this is our little payload, the S4 payload. And so it uses an Arduino microprocessor, but it has the ability to measure magnetic field, pressure, temperature, acceleration, humidity, and send all of the data, and GPS, send all the data down live using a regular computer Wi-Fi connection while the rocket is being launched up to 6,000 feet, and then as the payload drifts down underneath the parachute. And no one had ever done that before. Most people use the handband, like the satellites that Garrett was talking about. But we actually have maintained just commercial, because middle and high school teachers don't have ham radio licenses. They have Wi-Fi. So we have figured out a way to, to do high-powered rocketry with live telemetry streaming using Wi-Fi. And we, we have demonstrated this now repeatedly with our teachers. It's worked for the teachers. It's worked for us. Um, it was great fun. And now the students are taking measurements. This is just a picture of the the student team and uh, the teachers in Palmdale. Four of them were Girl Scout leaders, 14 of them were middle and high school teachers. Now this rocket program then turned into the Pocket Cube program at Sonoma State. Basically when, when Garrett retired from UC Berkeley, he decided to spend most of his career stealing my best students and building satellites with them. And so Kevin Zach, the student that had built and designed the S4 payload, uh, then later designed the T-Logo Cube board with of course a lot of help from the project mentors. And Garrett talked about our little T-Logo Cube satellite. There's a poster that we presented at this meeting. And Aaron Owen, sitting here in the third row, is one of the current students that's working on the project for future satellites. But here's our uh, pictures of our little vacuum chamber at <laughs> Sonoma State. Looks like a bell jar, because it is. Um, there's the Unisat 5 satellite, which is what all of the little CubeSats were loaded into. There's a picture of the Russian rocket. This is one of the Moorhead uh, staff, Sean McNeil, integrating the little satellite with Unisat 5 in Italy. And then this is uh, the radio telescope in, in our backyard between the chicken coop and the barn and the student team and Garrett and myself, um, and also the picture of our first beacon packets. It's been a tremendous learning experience for the students. This year we have middle school and high school students building the S4 payloads and flying them. Uh, they've been doing various launches on balloons and rockets. Some are taking them up on hot air balloons. Some of them are actually going to get in a private plane and fly them around. So we've got all sorts of really creative ways that the students are using these payloads. Um, we've gone one step further, which is because of the NASA Student Launch Initiative being canceled, the TARC teams that were the finalists had nowhere to go to do higher levels of experimental rocketry. And so we have offered up to five TARC teams free S4 payloads that they can put together themselves. And then we'll give them free rides on high-powered rockets out of Black Rock. And so um, we expect to be doing that next year. Meanwhile, my students are working with Garrett's help and our other mentors on at least one new CubeSat, the X-ray detector that he talked about. We've written proposals and gotten money from the National Society of Physics students to build a, a copy of the Yagi antenna at, on the campus so that I don't have to have the students camping out in my living room overnight waiting for the transmissions to come in over, over the thing in our backyard. And um, I've gotten funding from Space Grant to hire some interns from local community colleges. They're getting involved in both building antennas and building the, cube, the next CubeSats. And we're trying to make little portable radio antennas that can be distributed to high schools and to community colleges so they can at least listen to CubeSats um, and learn about antennas and satellites as they uh, fly over. And then starting this fall, we're going to be having an all-female pocket cube team trying to build one of these little 2P satellites because there are really not enough women that are doing this stuff. And when I'm out there launching my rockets, I'm, I'm one of the few level two rocketeers. So we need to have uh, more women doing this kind of thing. And Garrett suggested that. And I said, oh, you know, that's a good idea. Too bad I didn't think of it. 
So, um, so that's our pipeline, and that's where we're going for education. There, there's me with my level two rocket out of Black Rock right before it launched and I got certified. And so you can find more information about any of these projects, including all the open hardware and software for the S4 project. The, the rocket payload project is already published and we'll be putting the stuff from T-Logo Cube um, up later this year. Okay, so I guess now we'll talk, take any questions, if anybody has any questions or if there are any questions from the the web Rick wants to run that part. It's yeah, I just want to make sure that we uh, that we use microphones so that everybody on the webcast can hear as well. Um, so we'll start down here. There's Jeff Faust. Jeff Faust, Space Review. What are sort of the the, the key factors and or, or challenges to making greater use of these small sats for astronomical purposes? Is it is it the technology? Uh, particular subsystems on the satellites? Is it simply getting the funding to do the satellites? I mean, what's, 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 what's keeping further uh, advancement going on? Okay, I'll, I'll take that question. I think there are a few key things um, that, that are the biggest, pro biggest issues. Um, this, building the spacecraft part of it, not the science part, is, is a pretty big deal. Um, a lot of CubeSats fail because people don't work hard enough on that part of it doing the radio transmissions and all the things to make the logistics of it all work. But, you know, that's what was my goal in making a small thing that used cheap radios and antennas to sort of get past that to some degree. But people do lots of things and some, of, some satellites need more data than you can do with these. So that's a, that's a big challenge, but I think that's getting better because there are more companies that sell inexpensive solutions. Then there's, then there's the money to build your science instruments and to, and to do those. Um, I think if you're clever, you can get free instruments from people. A lot, of, a lot of scientists have things in their labs that were prototypes or things that they, they were never going to do anything but let them sit on the shelf. So you, if you're creative, you can actually get sensors and you can actually buy some very expensive ones. Um, but the real hard part of it is um, two more, you have to, you, you, the key to success is the testing. And this is something that is difficult to train students to understand how much testing you need to do. In, in, um, in, and so that's a big part of, the, of the, whether you're going to succeed or not. Um, if you just want to build stuff that doesn't work, well, it's pretty easy. But if you want to make things work, you've got to do a lot of testing. And then the other big thing is you've got to get the launch. Now, there are more and more launch opportunities. Uh, NASA has a program called Alana where you can compete to get a free launch. But I think the really exciting thing is in the new era, that you can go to the space station and launch a one U size CubeSat for about $80,000. And that wasn't true in the past. I mean, that's a very low number for cost. It's certainly not something that a bunch of students have in their pocket, but it's also not beyond uh, the reach of getting donations. So I think the launch costs were a big problem up until now, maybe less of a problem now. Can I add something on that? Yeah. Um, most rockets actually launch with dead weight on them. Uh, which is kind of a tragedy. If you have a rocket that's sending up 10,000 pounds and the person delivering the payload comes in at 90, you know, 9,700, they'll put 300 pounds of dead weight in ballast uh, rather than redo all the calculations. So we're basically flying water or lead on rockets already. The biggest reason that they won't put, um, you know, 300 CubeSats on instead is the risk. The fact that an active payload is a lot riskier than a dead weight. But with the rise in more commercial launch uh, startup companies, uh, a lot of the startups are suddenly saying, wait, I can sell some of this space at 10000 a pop? That could, you know, really be helpful. So I do think that the commercial, the growth of commercial launchers is really improving some of the launch opportunities that are going to be coming up for the presumed flood of uh, Pico satellites that are coming out. I think a, a major problem for astronomy is that people are always trying to make bigger apertures, right, and getting better sensitivity. And so that's hard to understand how you can do that in a little tiny thing. But there are a lot of measurements that you can do just as well if you have a distributed system. And so the whole idea of networking and distri distribution of the satellites and the sensors and then somehow combining the data, that's only just now becoming really feasible because computing and, and electronics and technology are finally catching up to the whole idea of distributed and people work over the computer so much now that they're not as afraid to rely on a network as the basis of, you know, a way to put together a lot of observations. 
Both? Oh. I was going to say, yeah. I, I think that's absolutely right, but it, it is picking the right problem, right? It's, it's picking the problem, uh, as, as you said, that the CubeSats are good for. Uh, what I am wondering for you guys is, is uh, I think also a lot of problems to do the science, it's not enough to have the sensor. You need to have the bandwidth to get the data back or else the onboard processing to do it. Well, and, and, and maybe you can comment on, right, on, right. on is that, I, I have a feeling that just in the last couple of years that's really gotten there. Well, I, I, I agree and I disagree. If you pick the right problem, you don't have a bandwidth problem. For example, gamma ray burst, only a, a bright enough ones occur that you're gonna look at, you're only gonna get one every two weeks. So that means you have two weeks to get all the data down from a 20, from a 30 second event. Yeah, it goes back to choose so a mission that You can actually do it with 500 bits a second. Now, if you, if you have something that's uh, trying to take pictures of the sky, well, you've got a problem. <laughs> so, right. so, so again, it's, 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 the data rate is also <laughs> about picking not just the right of experiment in terms of the sensor being big enough and having the capability on the thing. You've got to also pick something that's modest data rates, but Typical data rates that are easy to get with something like this, you can, you can, this can, this is a tenth of a watt, by the way. You can run it, I'm going to run the next one at a watt, so I can get to 10,000 bits a second. I think there are a lot of things you can do for 10,000 bits a second. Now, it's not going to be like the Hubble telescope or Chandra, but, but, you know, for a little thing, 10,000 bits a second is a, is a lot, is a lot of information. So, again, you have to really think about what to do, and I think that's part of the whole thing here is to have the science mentors in the community work with the students Ooh, yeah. to, that help, to help define mm -hmm. things. The students come up with a lot of great ideas, but most of them are not practical. And that's actually, you know, maybe it's a bit of a contrary, and I think the biggest limitation is mentorship. Um, the points that Garrett made were great. The tech is actually out there um, and getting better all the time. You can buy it. It's easy to build. Uh, but if you're doing a science mission, you need to have a science mentor that's part of your team. If you're, you don't just need an electrical engineer to build it, but the testing is such a huge part and you need to have someone that knows testing. So maybe because I'm from the smallest uh, of the institutions here, the biggest issue we have is having enough breadth among our faculty team to be able to support all the aspects. I mean, this is rocket science, but it's not rocket science, but it is rocket science, you know, done miniature. And the, the mentorship, Lynn had talked about, you know, how are we going to get the next round of engineers that now that a lot of the NASA ones are retiring, well, they're not all coming to academia and getting the, the people to have a strong enough effort. So a lot of the satellites that you see launched are coming from places that have a good program with the large number of people. I think there's a big hump in the beginning for starting up uh, a program because you just have to get the people. Mary? Hi, I'm Miriam Kramer, space.com. Uh, so I, I'm actually uh, curious about the Aerogel uh, CubeSat, <laughs> and um, I'm wondering if you can just give us a little bit more information. I mean, have any been launched, and I mean, how many would you need to properly characterize? Would they have to be in different orbits? Or? Alrighty, so uh, Aerogel is this um, basically solidified air that uh, NASA has used for capturing comet stardust and similar things. It's, I believe, the lightest solid known. And it has this weird inversely putty property. If you hit it lightly, it cracks and shatters. If you hit it with something going at kilometers per second, it just sucks it up and slows it down and captures it in a nice ballistic way. So it's excellent for orbit, because typically in orbit you're moving at 7 to 11 kilometers per second ideal for space apparatus, and it's a passive detector. Uh, we worked out the numbers. If you take a 10 centimeter by 10 centimeter chunk of aerogel, uh, like, and then you put a camera on the side, you can capture the streaks as it absorbs material, and you get a profile of the, essentially, the rough size and speed of what you captured and how frequently it happens, um, and then send that data down. In, Orbit, for a 90-minute orbit, we predict that you would get zero to one pieces of debris that are greater than uh, one millimeter or larger and detectable. And if you were to put one on a translunar mission, then you would potentially get zero to two particles every minute. That would be at the, like, one micrometer level and such for detecting. And so it's really a dust counter. The stage that we're at with Capital College, as I said, we're ramping up our, pro our program. So we've done high-altitude balloon launches where we've flown it up as an engineering test up to 72,000 feet and then the balloon drops. Uh, we weren't expecting to acquire data because nothing's moving fast enough there. 
we were surprised because we actually did capture an atmospheric grain and uh, sent it to some colleagues at University of Maryland's atmospheric group because they're like, wait, you captured an atmospheric grain from 72,000 feet. Uh, but that's why I, I tend to say the technology's there. Um, this was done by a five-person undergraduate student team with uh, mentoring and advice but no hands-on labor from two faculty members and they already got to the balloon stage in four months. So we're very optimistic that we'll be able to get to the uh, orbited stage within two years. I mean, these, the technology is there, all the pieces are there, and everything's starting to roll up together. So hopefully that answers the use of the aerogel. Uh, the, the dream would be that a, you just bolt one of these to any mission that's going to another planet and start mapping out the dust lanes in the solar system. If these are free flying, how big a deal is it that there's no attitude control? Attitude control is being worked on. If someone else wants to tackle some of the, the tech for that, free flying is great if you're just doing a radio uh, antenna or you're doing a magnetic field sensor, but attitude and ion drives are one of the big areas that yeah. are advancing now. So the, um, uh, the T-Logo tube did have a torque coil on it, and in principle, if it lasted a bit longer, it lasted for two months. That was the one thing that we didn't get to do much with, and but it could basically point anywhere in the sky by t magnetically torquing against the magnetic field. And the next one we build will have two coils, so we can control both the spin rate and the pointing. Um, this is rough pointing, sort of degree level type pointing. So as you know, astronomers like to point at things. So if you want to do astronomy, uh, most of the time you like to be able to point at the object you want to study, like the sun or a star or whatever. Or a line. You just want to know where you're or pointing. Or know where you're pointing, <laughs> right. So, so you can actually determine the uh, direction of pointing from the magnetometer data line to a few degrees. So t logo Cube had the ability in principle to point anywhere in the sky and to determine where it was pointing. We didn't really last long enough to, to thoroughly can test that out. The next satellite would be more capable in that regard and um, I don't see any reason in the future why you can't fly a star camera and get precise pointing information. Um, you can basically fly a cell phone camera to look at stars, put a little one centimeter lens in front of it, and you should be able to get arc minute type precision on where you're looking. And the, one of the reasons why I like gamma ray bursts is because they come from all directions. You never know where they're going to come from. So you don't really have to point because gamma ray bursts are basically everywhere. So again, if you pick the right science, yeah, it's Scott, a lot easier. Scott Palos, the Colorado uh, uh, reptile instrument for uh, electron and proton measurements, they just want to align with the Earth's magnetic field line, so they put a magnet in, and the magnet forces the satellite like a compass needle to align with the field line, so they had the orientation they need for the detector. So as long as you realize there's more than one way to tackle a problem, then there's some interesting stuff with attitude. You can use passive methods, you can just be a spinner or a free flyer. There's active ones like um, Garrett was talking about. And as I said, there's at least three teams that have um, announced their uh, pulsed plasma or ion drives for doing uh, high efficiency, low thrust uh, Pico satellite work. One thing that, um, that came up was there were really two different kinds of uh, of satellites, I think, that, that were described. There's the ones that you're just launching up on rockets, and then there's the ones that are actually going into orbit. Um, clearly, they, they must have a very different scientific potential, but also uh, very different kinds of requirements in terms of, you know, how hard it is to build one that will last long enough to, to return data. Um, but I didn't really hear you address that explicitly. Um, so, I mean, are, are undergraduate students able to build you know, orbiting satellites, it, it's, uh, as opposed to just things that'll be up for a few minutes? High school students have actually built one CubeSat down in Virginia. Now, it didn't work, but <laughs> they built it and they got it up there. Mm -hmm. So, and, and there are college teams that have built right. it. So well, and T-Logo Cube is oh, built by undergraduate students. Sonoma State doesn't have a graduate program. So, so It was built, and, and this, this $10 radio was able to communicate with one on the ground um, at 500 bits per second with all things built by students. So you need the right mentors and the right mix of people with skills. I mean, I'm lucky enough since I worked on major missions on NASA for 30 years that I could call on a lot of expertise whenever I needed it. I could mention John Doty in particular 
um, who works on the test mission, among other things that's being created now that you might have heard about this week. And so it, it, it is good if you can have some people you can contact that can help you solve problems. And in particular, John Doty always approved all the parts I selected. So I, I'd call him up and I'd say, you know, we can't buy space qualified parts that are radiation hardened because then the satellite would have cost a million dollars and you wouldn't be able to find the parts. But it turns out that you can fly inexpensive parts if you have some expertise in electronics and understand, you know, which transistors are likely to survive and which won't. So again, it comes back to the mentoring problem. What, what I would like to do, I, don't, I, I'm, I haven't done this, but it seems to me that the CubeSat effort is more or less of a grassroots effort. People just do it. There's no formal organization to, to, to explain how you get a launch or how you do any of this stuff. It might be nice if we had some kind of a mentor network where people could get help. I'll just make one more comment on that is that uh, the stats I gave were just for the orbiting satellites, mm -hmm. and so that's at least 80 uh, orbiting satellites that were successful that were built by students. Mm -hmm. Um, also, Scott Palo with the Colorado Project, they had about 80 students involved, and he said that the main role of the graduate students was really to provide continuity, that the undergraduates were doing the build work, but the grad students were there because undergraduates uh, have a much shorter time <laughs> than you have them in that sweet spot where they're trained up, but they're not graduating out. Are there any questions that have come in on the uh, webcast? No. Anybody have any other questions here in the room? Well, I, you know, I look at my cell phone and I think about how much computing power is in here relative to the kind of computers I was using, you know, even just 10 years ago. Sad um, phone. NASA threw a couple Android smartphones off the ISS to see how well they would last and if they could be a substitute for uh, CubeSats. <laughs> yeah. They're already up to Sat Phone 2, I think, and they're. Uh, playing around with it, so yeah. They're communicating with it yep. actively? Yeah, I mean, it, when I think about how fast this technology has matured in recent years, you know, it, I imagine that the kind of things you're talking about, you know, very limited data rates and all of that, uh, you know, are, are, I mean, I know there are physical limits, but it just seems like, like this is sort of a temporary problem and that it won't be long before, you know, you'll be able to pack the kind of technology that's in here into something that's, well, well, that's what this even is bigger. What you know? It's not yeah. different. The, yeah. the, the, and this, is, this is exactly that. I mean, without the cell phone technology development, you couldn't build something this small. Um, you, you may not have heard of Moore's Law. Moore's Law says, I think, that every year everything gets 1.8 times better. You know, the processors get lower power more capability, faster, everything goes up like sort of exponentially. And I'm still amazed to this day that that process continues. It doesn't seem to be stopping. I always thought that we would hit some kind of saturation. But actually, the miniaturization of the technology mm -hmm. is already not the problem. That's not one of the big problems anymore. Because as you can see, this board is not that complicated. And, and you have space to spare, as you pointed out. I have out. space to spare. I didn't even put my detector in. This processor here, right here, this little square, if you can see it, um, that has in it what 20 years ago would be an entire board. So it's all inside the one thing. Zach Manchester uh, at Cornell and a couple others say these are all still too big. They're doing chip sats and sprites, little one chip satellites. So, you know, whenever you do something, it's kind of like rock and roll. I could play the ferrets. Oh, I could do that smaller. Right. Well, part of the problem with making it smaller, though, is the students have to be able to solder the little teensy tiny <laughs> connections. And so this has actually got surface mount parts and, and 12 mil traces, and that's pretty much the limit of even our best soldering students to be able to, to we make this. We the slightly larger parts because the students weren't going to be able to solder the smallest ones. Mm -hmm. And we didn't want to have to bring in professional people to do it. And in fact, this was a real challenge to do that through the processor. Um, Kevin Zack, though, is, is our Lynn student that actually, you know, took a few weeks to learn how to do that, rather than have us send it out for professional manufacturing. Any other, you guys want to make any uh, summary statements, final comments? Okay, we'll just go down the line. You want to tell us to think small? No, what I'm going to tell you is, what would you fly? If you could send something like this into space, low Earth orbit, 90-minute orbits, 
just think about what would you fly. And if that doesn't inspire you, you might be in the wrong field of science writing. <laughs> uh, I think although uh, uh, Garrett talked about uh, uh, picking the problems that don't require imaging the sky, um, the Earth imaging folks like the Planet Lab startup in, in San Francisco are solving this problem. Uh, they have advanced X-band transponders, they have good attitude control. When that trickles down to the universities, mm -hmm. uh, then we can do some more conventional astronomy with CubeSats, and I think that's going to be really fun. I, I, I agree. That, I think that is going to happen. And remember that if you have images on orbit, if you have a processor on orbit, you can actually analyze the image and send the answer down. So you don't necessarily have to send the image down if you're doing astronomy. You can actually send the answer down. In fact, you could do a lot of exciting things like monitoring stars and things like that. You really could have an, you know, an ALGOL monitor that goes all, all the time. Um, I wanted to mention one thing. I went to the, uh, I don't know how many of you know this, but there's an annual conference at Cal Poly every year where all of the CubeSat enthusiasts from all over the world gather. It's about two or three hundred. And it is sort of like the biggest single conference um, that um, started like over a decade ago. Um, and this last year, a very interesting thing happened. Um, they took a survey at the beginning. And for the first time, there were more people who had never been to the conference present than people who had come before. It was mostly a club of people that were all talking to each other. So there's kind of an expansion there. But the other strange thing was there were only three scientists there. They were, they were all aerospace engineering students. They weren't actually astronomers or people like that. And I think I, 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 I may have been wrong, but I, I only counted two other scientists beside myself out of 300 people. Um, and so I think that it would be great if, if, if people like you could get the message out that this is real and that it it's, would be good for scientists to start paying attention. Well, my final comments are addressed to the whole uh, student training and manpower issue. NSF has a yearly competition for, for one CubeSat for which they award $900,000 or so. NASA provides free launches through the Alana program but has no actual now supported rocketry program for students or a supported CubeSat program where you actually get the money that you would need to build a CubeSat. And so I personally would like to see the people that are so big on pushing STEM education realize how important these kinds of programs are and put some actual serious funding and some opportunities behind them that have enough continuity that we could actually get some traction and build up the mentoring networks, build up, you know, the kinds of facilities that we need to be able to have other universities, small universities like myself, like Sandy's, you know, to have the facilities to go test your CubeSats and things like that because we can't afford to put in all the test stuff that NASA has. You know, that's not part of what they offer. They just, right now through the Alana program, you get a free launch, that's it. So where does the money come from to, you know, to build the parts, to pay the students, to, you know, help the mentors to do the testing. You know, we, we need to, to get that a little more um, organized. So I guess we can never again say there's no such thing as a free launch. Right. <laughs> launch is only. <laughs> um, all right. Well, thank you all very much for coming. Uh, thank, those of you who, uh, thank those of you who are on the webcast. Uh, the 224th AAS meeting continues for another day, but uh, our press program uh, concludes this afternoon, although our, our office will be open tomorrow. Um, I am confidently able to uh, invite you to the next AAS press conference. It will occur on Monday morning, January 5th, 2015 at 10.15 Pacific Standard Time in Seattle, Washington at the 225th meeting of the American Astronomical Society, and I hope that we'll see all of you there. So I thank our speakers again. Uh, thank Lynn Kaminsky especially for uh, helping to organize this seminar for science writers. Um, I think it was uh, quite interesting and I look forward to uh, seeing a lot more interesting science coming out of these teeny weeny satellites in the years to come. And if you want to touch the hardware, you can come up here. And don't forget to get your paper model. Thank you very much. <laughs>